How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on Curse of Strahd, a 5th edition module. In today's video we will be diving into Argen Vostolt, a ruined house which has fallen into decay, but of course, as we all know, in the lands of Barovia, not everything always stays silent. Of course, there's going to be a ton of spoilers, so players do not watch this, but DMs then want added insight on how we can go ahead and run this thing. Go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to go over. And here we are, Argon Vostolt. As we can see here, as soon as your players walk up, they can easily tell that this place has fallen into absolute ruin. The whole right side of this location has completely collapsed. And even actually further right, they can see that there used to be some sort of barn, but has long since fallen. So what is this location, and what the heck is in Argon Vostolt? Well... You see, this location is where a silver dragon named Argon Vost resided. He led an order of amazing and awesome paladins to go ahead and help the weary. And unfortunately, he was helping out people that were enemies of Strahd. So when Strahd came to invade these lands, Strahd's armies descended upon the holy order of the silver dragon. So what was the Silver Dragon actually doing? Well, the Silver Dragon actually came here with a purpose. The Silver Dragon, Argenvost, learned about the Amber Temple and decided that he did not want anyone to get their hands on it because it was filled with evil. So he built a house nearby and built a Holy Order of Paladins to go ahead and help out the people and, of course, defend from people, of course, treading upon that not-so-sacred place. Unfortunately, Strahd's armies came in, they started storming the place, and then killed them all, and even Argonvost fell with the house. After the Order of the Silver Dragon and Argonvost was killed, of course, the place was ransacked, and Argonvost's bones were hauled out all the way to Castle Ravenloft. But you see, the Order of Paladins, they were angry, and in their anger, they rose anew, but this time as Revenants. You see, the funny thing is, is in the DD universe, if you rise forth as a Revenant, you only are around for a year, and then eventually you just go ahead and have your spirit drift off into the afterlife. But in the land of Barovia, souls don't have anywhere to go. So here, this Order of Paladins has been residing for hundreds of years, steaming, angry. Now the question is, why don't those Revenants go forth and kill Strahd? Well, that is because the leader of this Order of Paladins thinks that it is far better to make Strahd suffer than it is to kill him. It is here in the Order of the Silver Dragon that we get some good info here that Vladimir, the leader of the Order of the Silver Dragon here, actually had all of his troops storm the castle. But when they arrived, they got told that Strahd was already dead. And at which point they said, eh, alright, let's go back. <laughs> But you see, it's interesting. We get some good info here that when Vladimir realized that Strahd had already died and been damned to a hell of his own creation, with nowhere else to go and nothing else to do, Vladimir set his knights to killing Strahd's agents and anyone else who might ease his suffering and torment. Consumed by hatred, the knights have lost their honor and nobility. Their redemption hinges on whether Vladimir can set aside his hatred. The undead knight can be found brooding in the ruins of this location. It's here in Revenants of Barovia that we get some good information. When you are walking around the lands of Barovia on the random encounter table, your players could interact with some Revenant that is from this order and is just traveling around the lands. If for some reason your players kill any of those Revenants, or they come here and start killing any of the Revenants, we get some cool information that... After some time, you roll a d20, and the spirit goes and inhabits any corpse that is located around. And this is really cool, because you can have it where your players are, in fact, meeting up with the same revenant multiple times, but in the guise of different corpses, which is pretty cool. Especially if you get the encounter of a corpse of one deceased player or NPC, wherever it happens to be, being inhabited by a revenant that they keep on fighting, that would be an epic and awesome and very tragic story. But you see, it's not only the Order of Paladins that is angry in the, their death, it is Argonvost himself. The dragon is pissed, but not at Strahd per se, more so it's annoyed at what his order has come to. Argonvost wants the people to let go. 
He wants their hatred to be absolved. And the only way to do that is to get his skull and bring it back to this location. And when that happens, the beacons will be lit and the paladins will finally see the light and finally be able to let go. So we get all this great information about the location of Argon Vashtult, but the real question is, why the heck would your player show up here? As we can see here, the location of Argon Vashtult, Area Q, is pretty much out of the way. It's really not along the road. Your players aren't going to accidentally stumble into this thing. They do pretty much have to go out of the way to get there. So how do we get our players to Argon Vashtult? And more importantly, why do we get our players to Argon Vashtult? Well, the why is pretty easy. If you have any reading that directs them to Argon Vashtult, whether that be one of the items is located here, or they have an ally in here in a one Sir Godfrey Gwellum, then you're going to need to find a way to go ahead and say, hey, it's located right here. But even if you don't have a card reading that leads you to Argon Vashtult, there's still plenty of reason to have your player show up here. There's some interesting characters here, and there's some great history to be learned. Now, how do we get our players to show up to Argon Vashtult? Well, the first answer is because your players are adventurers, and they get told that there was an order of paladins that used to live in these lands somewhere, but they've long since grown silent. And you go ahead and say, hey, it's located on the road here. You go ahead and head down south a little bit on the road, and you can't miss it. And if you've got adventurous players, then they'll go ahead and do it, because that sounds pretty awesome. But if your players need an actual story hook or something tangible to go ahead and drag them places, you could perhaps say that some people went missing on the road, and perhaps they went ahead and stayed there to go ahead and try and escape from the elements. That is a pretty easy sell, because if you have a group of villagers that is leaving Velaki for any reason and trying to make their way over to the Wizard of Wines or to Kresk, then perhaps they went ahead and stumbled across here. If your players went to the Vistani camp outside of Velaki and met with the Dusk Elves, perhaps the Dusk Elves direct you over to Argon Vostolt because one of their own members is missing. Maybe if you want to really get them there, but not have any real story hook, you could go ahead and say that at the intersection right there, there is a sign, and it leads to whatever destination that they want to go to, whether it says Wizard of Wines or to Kresk, and it's pointing to Argon Vostold because of some magic, and your players show up to this location not knowing what they're getting into. There's, of course, a ton of ways to get your players here, whether they choose to do so, or they just get swept up in the mist and arrive at its front doors. But what do they see when they finally arrive? Well, the thing that's really going to stick out here is that they see a multi-story mansion here and also an amazing dragon statue located outside. This dragon statue looks pretty epic, so when your players go ahead and show up here, you should go ahead and show them this art. And if you have super duper nerds, they might be able to tell immediately that it is a silver dragon. But if they don't know what type of dragon it is, then you can go ahead and make them make a perhaps a DC-15 nature check or history check to go ahead and figure out which kind of dragon it is. This statue isn't just only a statue though. If it is scrutinized with a detect magic spell, they can see that it radiates out an aura of evocation magic. This thing at one point used to shoot out a cone of cold, but of course the magic is long since faded away. Something important to note before we start stepping into this location is the fact that this grid is not what it appears to be, of course. These are 10 foot squares, so it's kind of a big deal. If you go ahead and just slap down a token, you gotta be aware of how big this place is. This is a ginormous location. In area two, we have the main entrance. Once you players step up here, they will all of a sudden hear and feel the dragon open up its mouth and exhale a 60 foot cone, but it is harmless cold air that splashes against the players. They may think that something bad is about to happen, but of course, as you describe it to them, say it's nothing, they'll probably get their anxiety going, and you can go ahead and have some fun messing around with them. In Area 3, we have the Dragon's Foyer. When your players make their way in here, they'll be able to look around and see this place for the magnificence it must have held at one point, but of course, it's long since dilapidated. They'll be see many doors located all around here, as well as staircases that lead up to the second floor. But most importantly, when they arrive here, they will see a great shadow with wings move across the walls and disappear. You hear the soft bestial hiss in the darkness. 
And that is a ominous yet harmless shadow of, of course, Argon Vostolt, who is trying to talk to them, but has no way of doing it from this location. In Area 4, we have the Spider's Ballroom. This, at one point, of course, used to be a vast chamber, but is now home to nine giant spiders. It is here where, of course, the level at which your players arrive at this location is going to be a tremendous impact. If they show up here very early on, then this is an easy TPK as giant spiders are going to outnumber the party, web them, bite them, and they're all going to go ahead and crumble. But if you have a higher level party, if you specifically have level 7, 8, 9, and they show up here, then it's going to be just a breeze. They wave their hands and the spiders are already dealt with. After dealing with all the locations here, I'm going to talk about some things you can do if your party is getting beat by all the monsters located inside. In Area 6, we have the Dragon's Den. When your players make their way through here, they'll be able to look around and see a sarcophagus. But when they specifically make their way inside, a fire will erupt in the dead hearth and assume a draconic form. It hisses and it instructs you to roll initiative. This is, of course, just a total mind game. The fire acts on initiative count 10 and has AC of 15 and 1 HP and immunity to fire, psychic, and poison. If this thing is hit by anything at all and reduced to 0 HP, it explodes and everybody inside of this room must make a DC 12 dexterity saving throw or take 4d10 points of fire damage. This is just a big old middle finger F you to a lot of players because a lot of the time you build up that rapport of if you roll initiative then combat ensues so if you do this and that is the norm for your campaign and for your players then they're probably gonna hate you but maybe they'll learn to not uh, go ahead and attack everything right from the get-go if for some reason your players don't attack or more importantly they're very unlucky and all roll very low initiative and allow this thing to talk the dragon will actually hiss and say, my knights have fallen into darkness. Save them if you can. And with that, the fire is going to go ahead and burn out. This is a really touching moment, but like I said, maybe depending on the group that you have, maybe just go ahead and skip the initiative entirely and just have this thing pop up. Because I'm willing to bet that a lot of groups, when they hear initiative rolled, they get into a shoot first mentality. In Area 7, the parlor, nothing really too much going on. Of course, this place is absolutely ruinous. And we'll see that it is a very common motif in a lot of the rooms located in this place. It actually gets a tremendous amount of text that you show off to your players and tell. But then, for the actual what is located inside, we get a single sentence. So, you know, that once again ties into how you go ahead and DM. And that ties into how your players interact with the world around them. If you give them this big old labored speech of, you know, oh, you see cobwebs, and you see the metallic, and you see the the dragon, da -da -da. if you say all that, and then there's nothing there, they may get tired of that, or they may appreciate that. You know, it entirely depends on the group to group. So feel free, if you have a group that doesn't care as much about that, just go ahead and say that, oh yeah, it's an empty room. But if you have a group that loves that stuff, then go ahead and dole it all out, and your players are going to love you for it. In Area 8, the Iron Gate, your players are going to be able to see that there is an Iron Gate here, and there's a padlock requiring a DC 20 dexterity check with Thieves Tools to open. They're really only going to use this if they snuck around the house and tried finding other ways in besides the front door that I have in my group that I just ran recently. But uh, realistically, there really isn't too much importance here. Your players can try and beat this thing up with a DC 15 strength check to go ahead and open it as well. In area 10, we have the kitchen. Really not much going on here other than there's a fun little jump scare. There's an iron pot that contains an ordinary bat. When the characters get close, it flies out and flaps about the room. You know, <laughs> just pretty cute. In area 11, we have the wine storage. The wine has long since vinegared and has been completely ruined. But the interesting thing about this location, of course, is the fact that there is, of course, Savid that resides in here. Savid is a dusk elf that volunteered to look around for Arbel. He went around searching around in the forest, but unfortunately, he got jumped by several needle blights. After taking some damage, he found some refuge in this mansion, where he went ahead and just hunkered down in the back of this wine storage area. 
He's pretty jacked up out of 16 HP. He's only got four left, so he's not really in any fighting shape. And he is going to go ahead and say, hey, you know, I, I did all this. I'm part of the Dusk Elves, this and that. Oh, and by the way, let me go ahead and tell you some stuff I know about this mansion. He's going to tell the players all about how Argonvost was a silver dragon, and he would always roam around in human guise. And unfortunately, he was killed, and the Vistani and Dusk Elves avoid the mansion, believing the dragon's ghost to haunt it. So Savid's story works out if you're running a very fast-paced and very quick in-game time world. But if you are playing in a game where time goes by relatively slowly, and most important of all, your players saved Arbel, and, you know, and weeks go by, then either one, Savid's just not going to be here, or two, you're going to have to come up with some other reason why he's residing within these halls. I think you can go ahead and keep the story that Savid went out to look for Arbel, even if your players spent, you know, days or weeks in between, and then eventually show up here. But why hasn't Savid left, and why is he still injured? Well, perhaps you can say that there is a direwolf that Savid got into a run-in with, and this direwolf is literally circling around this location, waiting for Savid to step out. And that is why Savid is injured still. He tried leaving earlier, and then got jumped by this thing and retreated back in here. And the direwolf isn't dumb enough to go ahead and step within these halls. So Savid is basically just trapped in here and can't go anywhere else. And that'll provide your players with something else to do when they're leaving this location. So, of course, if you have charitable players, they go ahead and maybe heal him or offer to spend some time here until he gets a rest in. But then what happens with Savid? Is he going to go ahead and pal around with the players or is he going to go ahead and try and bounce? Well, he knows his limits and he probably recognizes that this place is scary and doesn't want to explore it any more than he already has. So you could say that Savid simply stays here in this room until the players leave, but if you want him to be more adventurous, then you can go ahead and have him pal around with the party. But of course, if he goes around some of these locations, then he could potentially die, which could be very sad. In Area 12, we have the Dining Hall. When your players make their way in here, they'll be able to see, of course, a very long table. And they'll also be able to see that there is some light here, and it specifically a continual light that was cast upon the crystal chandelier long ago and has never been dispelled. They'll see that water damage that is leaking from the roof and may suspect that something is going on, but they won't discover what that is until they go up to the second floor. In Area 13, we have the Chapel of Mourning. When your players make their way in here, they'll be able to see, of course, this chapel that was dedicated to the Mourning Lord oh so long ago. But of course, they'll see three armored figures kneeling before an altar. So if you have a group that doesn't like to, you know, get into any sort of trouble, this is perfectly fine. They can go ahead and look in and see that there's three kneeling figures and go ahead and back out. But if you have an inquisitive group, like most groups are, they're going to be in a bit of trouble. Because if they interact with these revenants at all, the revenants come forth and, blinded by anger, strike out against the party. And once again, this will really highlight the severity of whatever level they are. If they are a lower level, there is no chance that they're going to be able to take on three revenants at a time. But if they're a higher level, then perhaps, you know, it's going to be a lot better of a fight. But if they are in that lower level range, three, four, five, maybe even six, then this is going to be pretty friggin' tough. Of course, the revenants aren't the only thing that are located in here. They'll also be able to see that there's a door that leads outside, and there is some staircases that lead up to the second floor. Now... The spiders are going to go ahead and attack anyone and try and gobble them up or maybe save them for a later, you know, feeding time. But as we get here, the revenants basically state that they attack with the characters seeking to drive them out of Argon Vostold. So, if you go ahead and have them attack as is, then there is a pretty decent chance that someone could potentially die. What I would go ahead and say is you have these revenants clearly exclaim, get out or we're going to kill you. And if you are that transparent, then your players are going to know what's up. And if they press any further, then go ahead and let them have it. But if they heed this warning and back off, then the revenants resume their post and go ahead and start kneeling and praying. Once again, I'll be talking about some fun things we can do if your players get wiped around here. Because my oh my, is that a certain possibility? In Area 15, we have the cemetery. When your players are meandering about through here in this fog-filled cemetery they will actually begin to discover that several of these places are dug up. 
but with a perception check, they can reveal that these things were not dug up from above. Someone crawled out from below. In Area 16, we have the Dragon's Mausoleum. If your players are able to make their way in here by pulling this thing open with a DC 15 strength check, they can discover that this mausoleum has been pretty much untouched. And if they make their way in here, they can see that written in Draconic is... Here lie the bones and treasures of Argenvost, Lord of Argenvostolt, and founder of the Order of the Silver Dragon. Of course, they come in here, and the place is pretty empty. This is the location that Argenvost's skull must be returned to in order for the beacon to be lit and for the paladins to be saved. Skipping over the boring locations, we get to Area 20, the South Alcove. When your players arrive in here, they'll be able to see that there is velvet curtains that hang in the alcoves, and if your players peel them back, they can discover that there is something atop a white marble pedestal. Beneath the black cloth is a severed head of a randomly determined character, an illusion created by Strahd's consciousness. So once again, just more fun little jump scares that you can go ahead and peep out to the players. If they arrived here and they haven't fought anything yet, and it's only been jump scares, then it's going to eventually get on them. You know, they're going to be thinking to themselves, oh, all these jump scares, you're going to jump us with something. But if they already fought something here, then having the fights intermixed with all the jump scares is certainly going to be interesting. They're probably going to get a little bit antsy and may start doing some reckless things. In Area 21, the North Alcove, there's nothing behind the curtain here. But what's interesting is, is if the characters part the curtain and leave, when they return, the curtain is drawn back. So maybe that can go ahead and tell them that maybe something's here and messing with them or whatever. But of course, that's going to be another fun little thing of, yeah, you notice that uh, as you return here, you, you look and you see something druid again. In Area 23, we have the storage room. This place is currently being flooded as there is a leak in the roof. This room has been thoroughly looted and the wooden floor is soft and spongy and it can't support more than 100 pounds. If someone more than 100 pounds steps forth here, they fall 20 feet and take 2d6 points of bludgeoning damage as they fall into area 12, which is the dining room. In area 25, we have the trapped hallway. This one is a bit of a doozy. When your players make their way down to this location, they can look left and right and see that there's several doors. So your players may go ahead and start going around. But once any character hits the threshold of any of these traps, that is when the trap springs. A wall of stone is going to shoot up where this red line is, basically locking them into this hallway. At the same time, all of the phantom warriors that are located around here are going to begin pouring into the hallway. This is really bad. If you have a group that is traditionally all about having a front line that protects the back line, then this may prove a bit of a trouble. Because, of course, if they're trapped in this hallway and they're getting hit from both sides, then they may not have enough places to cover. The wall of stone isn't going anywhere either. It vanishes only after 10 minutes, which is more than enough for a combat to last. So if your players get into a fight here, they got to deal with three phantom warriors coming from the left and four coming from the right. So hopefully your players are packing something good and hopefully they are lined up right. And also, hopefully, importantly, they don't get split up. If you have some players that are on the inside of the place and are part of the fight, then that's good. But if you have some people that are sticking back purposely and the wall of stone raises up, there really isn't too much they can do. There is no actual way to get to this location other than some tremendous means such as, you know, I guess scaling the walls outside and breaking through one of the windows. That's pretty much the only way your players are going to make their way through here. Area 26, we have the Northeast Guest Room. When your players make their way into here, once again, another fun little jump scare. A hissing dragon made of ash and smoke will erupt out of the fireplace. This is a smoke method, but this thing will only fight in self-defense. What it wants to do is just fly away. If it's left alone, it flies out of the room and speeds all up around and eventually makes its way to Vladimir's throne. The Phantom Warriors that jump out of these rooms are going to go ahead and fight, and they fight until they are destroyed. Nothing going on fancy in Area 27, but in Area 28, we have a very, very powerful item. Four Potions of Invulnerability. What are those? When you imbibe this, for one minute after you drink this potion, you have resistance to all damage. That is incredibly powerful. 
if you give this to your players, they're probably going to be holding on to this forever and all the time until the final boss fight, which is perfectly fine. But of course, if the final boss fight is Strahd, Strahd might see them drink this potion and decide to run off, but we're going to be getting into all of that in a much, much later video. Going up the stairs, going over some rubble, your players will be able to find Area 36, the Dragon Audience's Hall. When they make their way in here, they'll be able to see, of course, all the ruin and the previous beauty this place once held. But most importantly, they'll be able to see Vladimir Horngard. He is sitting on his throne. If the characters approach him, he's going to immediately say, go away. And if they don't immediately leave, you get some really cool exposition that he goes ahead and says to the party, if they haven't already picked up on it. And also, even if they do already know what it is, then it coming from this guy's lips is going to be certainly more impactful. And go ahead and give it that gravitas it deserves. So after giving this monologue, Vladimir is only going to fight in self-defense, or if your players continually persist and try and get him to fight Strahd. The first time Vladimir takes damage, six Phantom Warriors are going to materialize and join in the fray, coming to his defense. This guy is really scary. He is a revenant on roids. He has a lot more HP, he actually has higher AC, and he's also got a plus 9 to hit, and he traditionally deals 4d6 plus 4 points of damage. But what's also very interesting to note about this is, it also states Vladimir deals an additional 4d6 points of slashing damage with this weapon against Strahd, which is contradictory to the text that we get. It states that Vladimir wouldn't go out and fight Strahd, but it also states here that against Strahd, he would do more damage. Why is that? That will be coming up in a villain's voice on Vladimir. Here we also get some good information that Vladimir is actually the lover of Sir Godfrey Gwillem, which is a person your players are going to meet in Area 37. Hatred so clouds Vladimir's mind that he can't remember that Sir Godfrey was his beloved in life. If Sir Godfrey helps the characters and faces Vladimir, anguished recognition shines in Vladimir's eyes, yet only lighting the beacon can free him. There is a ton of amazing roleplay elements you can have with that, especially once your players get a full idea of what's going on here. But we'll be getting into all that with Sir Godfrey. Vladimir Horngard also possesses a plus two greatsword, which is one of the best weapons your players can get in this entire world. And plus two weapons are a pretty powerful thing. And also very, very important, the fortune of Ravenloft. If your fortune reveals that the item you need is located here, it is going to be in Vladimir's possession but he's not willing to par with it unless the beacon of Argen Vashtold has been lit. Tons of amazing stuff to do with Vladimir coming soon to a villain's voice near you. In area 37, we have Knights of the Order. When your players arrive in here, they'll be able to see five revenants. If they have already fought to some of the revenants downstairs, then this is bad and they're probably going to be scared and run away. But whatever the case may be, go ahead and have Sir Godfrey Gwillem stand up amongst all of them and... Go ahead and talk to the party. Sir Godfrey is the only person who still has more of a sense about him. He can sense that the spirit of Argenvost isn't happy with the current state of the order here and is going to go ahead and beseech that the players help him out. He can go ahead and give your players all the information on all the details located here if they don't already have it and he can be very forthcoming with his feelings about what's going on around here. Sir Godfrey, of course, could be your fated ally. He could be the enemy of Strahd, in which case if your players come here and try and recruit him, then some bad things are going to happen because he is going up against his lover's orders. His orders are currently to not fight Strahd. But of course, if Sir Godfrey is told, hey, you're helping us fight Strahd, then there's going to be a bit of an opposition here. If he is the fated ally, he'll go ahead and join the party, and this decision is going to incur the wrath of the other revenants, triggering an armed conflict. But that is only if the beacon hasn't been lit yet. If the beacon has been lit, then Sir Godfrey remains a revenant, and he will go ahead and help the party out, because all the other revenants are going to drift off into spirit land. So this can only happen if your players go to Castle Ravenloft, pull off some amazing caper, and retrieve a several hundred pound skull, and lug it all the way back here. So uh, that goes back into, of course, 
I highly encourage people to go to Castle Ravenloft multiple times throughout the campaign. Of course, this could be left for an after credit scene where your players go and make the land a better place and do all the fun stuff that they couldn't do because of Strahd. But I certainly think that there's a lot of amazing things that only happen if they happen in the middle of the campaign, such as this. Your player storming Castle Ravenloft, stealing the skull and getting out of there, bringing it back here, and then restoring this Paladin Order to light. I think that's just amazing symbology and can have so much fun roleplay implements. So who is Sir Godfrey Gwillem? Well, he is another Super Paladin. This guy isn't just any other ordinary Paladin. He is in fact a level 16 Paladin. He's incredibly badass. So in addition, of course, to all the Revenant fun stuff that he has, you know, being able to take whatever damage and not care and regenerate, he's also, of course, got these huge list of spells and a whole bunch of spell slots for being a level 16 Paladin. So he's a pretty powerful ally. You know, he hits really, really hard and he is pretty freaking good. Once again, I'm being forced to plug my own videos here, but I'll be going over all the individual allies in its own separate little series. In Area 40, we have Argon Voss Study. This is the location, of course, where Argon Voss used to chill out. This place used to hold a vault and had a whole bunch of amazing stuff, but the place has been looted. But the only thing that remains is a journal of Argon Vost. This journal is written by Argon Vost as the manor was being assaulted. So there's some really great info about how his people are slowly dying out and he goes ahead and says his final last lament. He does not fear death. Though his body will die, his spirit will live on. Now to battle. Pretty cool stuff. There is also a slashed picture in here and if your players are able to mend this thing with some magic, then it will actually come to life and the beacon in the picture flashes a brilliant silver light and a voice will cry out saying, my skull lies in the fortress of an enemy. It continues saying, return my skull to the rightful crypt, and my spirit will shine here forever, bringing hope to this dark land. Very powerful symbology there. The roof is just absolutely beat to hell, as you can see. There's a big old hole in there, and of course the you know whole right side of the manor is jacked up. But what's really cool is there is some ballista here, and there is in fact a dragon gargoyle. And the dragon gargoyle actually whispers when you go near it, when the dragon dreams its dream within its rightful tomb, the light of Argon Vostolt will beam and rid this land of gloom. Once again, it's re-emphasizing the fact that your players should go ahead and bring hope to the people of this land. If your players think of some creative things to do with the ancient ballista in Area 45 here, woe to them! The ballista falls apart if disturbed. Of course, this thing has been sitting out in the elements and has not been, you know, touched up at all. So, of course, it's going to break. Going to the beacon atop the tower is not an easy ordeal as they have to go up against phantom warriors with spectral longbows. In Area 49, they must make their way through a tirade of arrows, except this really isn't that big of a deal. <laughs> These longbows are only coming in at a plus two to hit and only deal 1dh point of damage. Not really that scary. They do make two attacks each turn, which... You know, if they both attack, then there is a good enough chance that at least one of them hits. But even when they do hit, it's not going to be doing that much damage. So, realistically, if your players are a higher level, I'd probably just go ahead and just throw this out the window. It seems like a waste of time to me. In Area 51, as they climb the beacon landing, there is a potential chance that they could go ahead and fall into rubble. A creature that falls on the section here must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or fall 20 feet below into area 50. The collapse of this section creates a 10 foot gap in the landing. So really, once again, just, you know, more delaying tactics for not really that much, really. In area 53, the beacon of Argon Vostolt, after going through the entire location here and going over all the traps and all the undead, they finally arrive at the beacon. And it's here where they can look out and see the world all around. They can see so much. And of course, if the beacon is lit, meaning that they return the skull of Argonvost to its crypt, then a light will be shining forth from this location. If your players haven't explored around the land of Barovia too much, then coming here and specifically climbing to the top is a really great way to get some insight on what's going on. They can see the village of Velaki, the old bone grinder, the Abbey St. Markovia, and Kresk from this location. So really it's a great way to go ahead and show off some of the locations that they may have skipped or may not have seen so far. 
So if your players return the Skull of Argonvost here, we get some great information that this light literally can be felt by everyone. And the light allows all good aligned creatures to experience glimmers of hope and joy while evil creatures find the light disconcerting. Very, very cool. You know, especially if you're running a campaign where your players are constantly dealing with the poor, poor people of the land of Barovia that are constantly filled with sorrow and despair, giving them some joy and light in their life, even if it's just a little bit, is fantastic. And especially if they continue to do these amazing things to bring light into the world. But that's not all this light does. Beacon of Protection. While the beacon shines, characters and other creatures that oppose Strahd gain plus one to AC and saving throws for as long as they remain in Barovia. That is awesome. This is how you reward players for doing tremendous deeds. For going all the way there to Castle Ravenloft, getting the skull, getting it out, bring it here, and doing this amazing deed to not only help out all these paladins, you know, go into the light, but also to bring forth a ray of sunshine to the land of Barovia, they get rewarded very, very strongly. Plus one to AC, that's just awesome. Plus one to saving throws, that's fantastic. And that's going to make them feel great. Because I promise you, there's going to be times where they just barely don't get hit, or if they make their saving throw by one, and it's going to be because of this. And they're going to be reminded of the amazing things that they did. And now, of course, with the beacon lit, the revenants will be at rest. Vladimir and all the other revenants that haunt Barovia see the light and remember the good, noble things they did as knights. And they are going to go ahead and release their hatred. And they're all going to go ahead and go into another place. Of course, if your players have Sir Godfrey Gwillem at their party, then he is not going to go ahead and join them just yet. He knows that he needs to help out the party and defeat Strahd before he can go ahead and join his fallen order. And Fortune's Ravenloft, if your card reading reveals that the treasure is here, it's resting on the west windowsill. Pretty cool. So this chapter, we get some really great information on the Paladin Order here, and we get this big old mansion, and of course, we get some special events. So let's go ahead and take a look at those, shall we? The first special event is Special Delivery. This encounter occurs while your players are inside Argon Vostolt. You can go ahead and just run this whenever. Because this place is deathly silent, they'll easily be able to hear the crunch of wagon wheels on gravel coming up to this location. If they go ahead and look outside, they can see that there is a cart being pulled by a draft horse and of course being driven by a mad Vistani named Kolia. After relieving himself on the statue, Kolia untethers the horse and rides back to the Vistani camp outside of Velaki, leaving the cart and its cargo a plain wooden coffin. Of course, your players are probably going to be curious about what this is because it's no coincidence that a Vistani just shows up, drops off a coffin, and then just makes it out of here. So your players are probably going to be curious. This coffin has the name of one of the PCs, determined randomly, neatly chiseled into the lid. If this coffin is open, a swarm of bats flies out and begins attacking whoever is the named character. But if the character is not in sight, the swarm flies away. You know, this is just a little cute, you know, gotcha moment from Strahd, you know. I like the idea of Strahd just toying with a party like this nonstop because they're probably experiencing a bunch of jump scares inside of Argon Vostolt, and then as soon as they get here, then this is just another jump scare because realistically a swarm of bats isn't going to be able to do too much. So when do you run a special delivery? Well, I would suggest that you go ahead and do it when your players have explored enough of Argon Vostolt, but of course at least have explored a little bit because you don't want to have this where they're still outside. You want this Vistani to get away because you don't want your players asking him any questions. So I would say maybe if your players are on the second or third floor, they can hear this and they can look out a window and see. And if they start yelling out to the Vistani, Kolya is just going to go ahead and ignore them, hop on the horse and get away. So make sure that Kolya doesn't have to answer because then he's probably going to have to say, you know, oh yeah, Strahd made me do this, da da da. And you're going to have to come up with that story on your own. The second special event we have here is Ardegal's Hunt. Esmeralda arrives at Argon Vostolt on the back of a riding horse stolen from the Vistani camp. She heard that this place used to harbor enemies of Strahd and contain secrets of the vampire's destruction. So she's making her way here, but the problem was is that she is being followed by Ardegal. Not only is Ardegal arriving on horse, he's also got two Vistani alongside him. But these Vistani are actually riding direwolves. Pretty scary. Argal is determined to capture Esmeralda and haul her back to the Vistani camp 
to face the punishment for horse theft. He does nothing to antagonize the characters, however, and returns to the Vasani camp if he can't convince them to give up Esmeralda. So there's definitely a lot of ways you can go ahead and run this. If you have Esmeralda show up here and immediately make her way into the house, then maybe Argel goes ahead and stands outside like it's a western and, you know, demands that Esmeralda be thrown out and maybe your players do do this or maybe they don't, in which case, you know, things will ensue. This event is really determined based on your players' rapport with Argal and Esmeralda. Do they know who Esmeralda is? Do they know who Argal is? Do they really have a good relationship with the Vistani? You know, it's really going to depend. Your players may have already met Esmeralda multiple times, in which case they'll go ahead and say, yeah, screw you, we're not going to give up Esmeralda. But maybe your players got on the bad side of Esmeralda, and then Esmeralda says, oh shoot, and then she's caught between a rock and a hard place. Of course, if either one of these individuals is the fated ally, that will definitely pretty much determine which side they are on. If they have Argal as the fated ally, then they're probably going to go ahead and say, yeah, let's go ahead and have Argal, you know, let's give Esmeralda up. And if they have Esmeralda as the fated ally, they're going to definitely stand their ground and say, no, screw you. Argal is not going to press in, though. He's not going to go ahead and tackle the whole party. He's just going to go ahead and head back to the camp, and he'll maybe go ahead and strike at the party at a later time. So as I mentioned before, with the spiders and the revenants and whatever else shows up in this location, there is a pretty good possibility that a lower level party is going to get whacked. Because you have a level 3 party go up against 9 spiders, they're probably going to get overwhelmed. You have a level 4 party go up against 3 revenants, they're probably going to get overwhelmed. So what do you do if you're going ahead and running this as is and you don't want to fudge the numbers? Well, you go ahead and have Sir Godfrey Gwillem step in. The spiders are a very easy sell. Spiders don't natively kill people. In fact, it says right there on their character sheet that their poison is specifically designed to only paralyze people. So this is very easy. You know, spiders in the real world that don't kill things immediately, not these kind of spiders anyway. What they do is they paralyze people and then hang them up and then save them for a later time. So if your party gets TBK'd by spiders, then all of a sudden they find themselves waking up some time later and standing above them is an undead paladin who beseeches to go ahead and help out his order. If your party gets into a tussle with some revenants, then pretty much the same thing occurs, except for the revenants would try and kill them. So if the battle is about to turn and someone is about to die, then Sir Godfrey Gwillem is going to go ahead and step up and lock blades with whoever is about to deal the finishing blow and say, hey, you guys back off, I'll go deal with them. And then Sir Godfrey Gwillem is going to go ahead and grab up the party, take them elsewhere, and he's going to say, hey, sorry about that. You know, these guys are blinded by hatred, but you can go ahead and help me out. The Phantom Warrior fight, this is a little bit harder because your player is a little bit trapped here. So if you are not wanting a TPK here, but it looks like it's going to be a TPK, then perhaps Sir Godfrey Gwillem goes ahead and smashes through a window, starts grabbing people, and starts yeeting them out, and, you know, making sure that they don't die. That could be pretty epic. You know, that would certainly be a way to introduce a character. And just like that, that is all the locations of Argon Vostold. Pretty amazing place but realistically doesn't have any impact on the campaign if you don't want it to be. But there's just so much going on, there's amazing characters here, and of course the symbology of bringing light to the land is just so epic that I find it very hard to pass up. If you don't want this in your game, you don't have to have it, but I certainly recommend it. You know, whether that be your players getting told to come here, or they just happen to stumble across here, whatever the case may be, Interacting with the people around here is just absolutely awesome. How are your players going to go ahead and grab the skull and bring it all the way back here? Well, I'm going to leave that for the Castle Ravenloft video because that is going to be a lot to dive into there. <laughs> Every single room has something major about it. So go ahead and tell me, are your players heading to Argon Vostolt? And if so, why? Is there a reason? Do they have a card reading here? Do you really like the symbology here? Maybe you're going to start expanding some things. Maybe instead of all the paladins crumbling to dust when you light the beacon, perhaps they go ahead and stand resolute and storm Castle Ravenloft one last time. That could be an epic conclusion to this campaign. Do you imagine your players are going to go ahead and tackle this place head first, diving into combat nonstop? Or are they going to go ahead and look around and be all sneaky and stealthy, and if they see any sort of danger, they're going to run away? I want to know these things because I know I've got a mixed bag of players whenever I run this module. So go ahead and tell me all these things. I would love to hear it. That is going to do it for me. 
Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.